All right, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming along to Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar this week. As always, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their connection to land, waters and community. For those of us in the Canberra region, we particularly pay our respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and we pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. As I said, thank you for joining this, today's Wednesday seminar, which will be presented by Cathy Brown and Christo Marais van Vuren, both from Geoscience Australia. And their topic is defining Australia's stratigraphy. Cathy and Christo's work centres around managing, updating and delivering the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database, the ASUD. The ASUD brings together published knowledge of Australian rocks and makes that information available from a single source. The database is being constantly updated as new information is published. And as well as being an invaluable resource in its own right, the ASUD also underpins and enables a range of geological maps and interpretive geoscience products, as Cathy and Christo will show us. So about our speakers today, Cathy obtained her BSc in geology from the ANU in 1980 and worked at the ANU, the University of New England and the Geological Survey of New South Wales as a lab technician and as an editor before returning to study information management at the University of Canberra in 1989. She joined the Bureau of Mineral Resources, the precursor to GA, permanently in 1991, where she initially compiled mineral deposit data and managed the Australian Stratigraphic Units database. From 2002, Cathy spent several years working in Geoscience Australia's inorganic geochemistry lab, where she worked with GA's geochemical field geology and rock store data and its management. Cathy became chair of the Australian Stratigraphy Commission in 2008 and returned to the Stratigraphic Units database team where she has been ever since. And Christo obtained his BSc in Geology and Geophysics from Macquarie University in 2014. Subsequently, he undertook contract roles working for the exploration industry as a geophysics field technician before moving to Canberra in 2016. And that same year, he joined Geoscience Australia initially as a contractor working with the ASUD team and then becoming a full-time staff member in 2017. He now also fulfills the role of the ACT Subcommission Chair of the Australian Strategic Commission. So we're going to have a tag team uh, presentation today and I'll welcome Cathy to the podium first. Hello everyone and thank you for choosing to participate in this seminar. Before we start, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians and to acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community, not only for the Ngunnawal and Ngambri lands from which we are presenting today, but also throughout Australia. I pay my respects to the people, the cultures and the elders, past and present. I will start off today introducing some basic concepts what is available today and how we got to that point. Then Christo will discuss why defining stratigraphic units is important, what tools are available to assist with that, and then we'll finish up with some examples of further uses of the data. We hope to provide you all with a sense of Geoscience Australia's role in maintaining and delivering a foundational data set for, for the benefit of Australia and Australians the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database. This is a database that underpins many geoscience maps and interpretive products produced by GA and by our state and territory geological survey colleagues. It's also widely used by industry and academia. I note that one of our senior colleagues in a state geological survey has called the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database Australia's secret weapon in pre-competitive geoscience. <laughs> we recognise that not everyone in the audience is a geologist, uh, so we'll start with an explanation of what stratigraphy is and why it's useful, in fact essential. Uh, we'll show how stratigraphic terminology is managed in Australia and Geoscience Australia's role. This will lead us into an explanation of what the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database is, including how you can access it. 
A key part of managing stratigraphic terminology is defining stratigraphic terms. There are well-established processes for defining rock units, but as you'll see, uh, they're not always followed as well as they could be. But we hope to show you that these processes are relatively straightforward and we encourage all geologists to use them. And finally, we'll provide some examples of how the, the Stratigraph in its database is used and the sorts of geoscience products it enables. So, let's start with a basic definition. Essentially, stratigraphy is how geologists classify the rocks that they observe. All science disciplines use classification systems uh, to make sense of observations. This is true for the science of plants, animals, viruses, stars, all sorts of things. As with all these classification systems, stratigraphic classification allows us to place observations in context and to communicate effectively with each other. So more formally, stratigraphy is the description of all rock bodies forming the Earth's crust and their organisation into distinctive useful, mappable units based on their inherent properties or attributes. This is done in order to establish their distribution and their relationship in space and their succession in time. It can lead to predictions of more and less likely places to search for mineral, energy and water resources. It can also aid all kinds of land managers to better understand their country and aid with the recognition and conservation of unique features and landscapes. The classification of geological observations into stratigraphic units or packages allows mapping of related rocks across large areas. In this way, geological maps are an example of the benefit of stratigraphic classification, usually distinguishing different rock types and their age. The excerpts shown in this slide are from William Smith's 1815 geological map of the British Isles, the subject of Simon Winchester's popular book. Widely regarded as the first modern geological map, this map transformed the way in which the geology of the surface and subsurface was understood, and it helped to predict where the resources of interest at that time, such as coal, iron and tin could be found by identifying areas of similar rock type and age around the country. Equally importantly, William Smith was able to use this map to predict where particular resources would not be found based on the map stratigraphy. In fact, he bemoaned the money that was being wasted looking for resources in the wrong places. In this way, the classification of geological observations into stratigraphy is still used today to make geological maps and to guide resource, resource exploration. Here is a modern Australian equivalent of the William Smith map, the one to a million scale surface geology of Australia, produced by Geoscience Australia in 2012. It is designed to be used as a digital data set and has extensive it has an extensive map key to go with it, explaining the different rock units shown in the different colours and polygons here. <clears throat> and here is an illustration of part of the forthcoming solid geology of Australia, uh, which looks undercover as well as at the surface. It's divided into broad time slices and we're showing part of the Neoproterozoic slice here. Maps like this are based on the fundamental classification of rocks into stratigraphic units. And as you heard at a Wednesday seminar a few weeks ago, the Alkaline Rocks Atlas is a recently released GA product, more focused on highlighting particular rock types that are prospective for some of the critical minerals Australia needs to find to support the energy transition away from fossil fuels. Once again, Maps like this are based on the fundamental classification of rocks into stratigraphic units. And here is an example of a different kind of product, a predictive model of mineral potential. As well as a range of other data inputs, production of this model relied heavily on queries 
from the Australian Stratigraphic Units database to map out the distribution of favourable and non-favourable rock types. So the geoscience data that is compiled into the Stratigraphic Units database is helping to support the fundamental mapping data sets such as soil geology and alkaline rocks. Uh, and this in turn helps to support mineral potential assessments for critical minerals. I hope these brief examples have illustrated the value of classifying our geological observations, of organising these observations into named stratigraphy that can be mapped. We'll now turn to how stratigraphic information is managed in Australia and what role Geoscience Australia plays. Although mapping started much earlier, the need for nationwide agreed procedures was first recognised in Australia in 1948 with the formation of a Stratigraphic Nomenclature Committee and the development of an Australian code. This moved on over time to the adoption of the International Stratigraphic Guide in 1978 and an abridged version of the current edition of that guide is available online and that's what this slide is illustrating. This guide forms the basis of our approach to stratigraphy today and is a useful source of information for anyone planning to establish a new stratigraphic unit. Members of the Australian Stratigraphy Commission can help with interpretation of the international guide and with specific Australian procedures. And so the Australian Stratigraphy Commission is a standing committee of the Geological Society of Australia. It has members in each state and territory, many of whom work in government survey organisations and who are considered the experts on the geology in their regions. The Australian Stratigraphy Commission also provides input to the International Commission on Stratigraphy in particular to their subcommission on stratigraphic classification. Geoscience Australia took a leading role in the Australian Stratigraphy Commission when Albert Brakel took on the role of chair. And that role continued with me from 2008. This is consistent with GA's stated role in being the authoritative custodian of geoscientific data for the benefit of all Australians and also to provide national and international leadership in geoscientific data. Hand in hand with the code's guidelines, the Stratigraphic Lexicon or Geological Index was developed and housed at the Bureau of Mineral Resources, now Geoscience Australia. This was done by agreement with the State and Territory Geological Surveys. Initially a card file, Digital data storage started in 1979 and a digital search tool has been available to the public since 1994. Although we've never had the resources to get all the old card file data into the digital database, some of it, probably about half, has been added over many years. And in 2018, funds were found to do image scans of the remaining cards so that they're more easily findable and can be shared remotely with anyone who is doing research on long-standing units or historical nomenclature. The database is now called the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database, or ASUD for short. Uh, it's compiled and updated from a variety of geological sources, uh, geological publications I should say, ranging from maps and data sets, explanatory notes and journal articles, and various other published reports. These sources are all recorded as part of the indexing process. The indexing is prioritised on the data, data source reliability and on relevance to known current research, particularly in the government geological surveys. And while the primary purposes haven't changed very much over the years, the improved accessibility of the data is allowing it to be more widely used and for more research purposes than originally envisaged. Indexing of publications uh, and data entry are ongoing activities to maintain the currency of the database as well as we can. 
so that we help to fulfil one of Geoscience Australia's Strategy 2028 goals, enabling an informed Australia. GA is also ensuring that the database complies with fair data principles, that is, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. And this list indicates what kinds of information we seek to capture in the indexing process. As you'll see later, these points are also important criteria in defining a stratigraphic unit. There are currently only two permanent strat units staff, plus contractors, to do a range of tasks to identify new publications, index them, get the data into the database, uh, quality control the data, including updating stratigraphic units information, and responding to stratigraphy and database queries. A snapshot in, of the database in June 2023 showed that it recorded some 18,500 names, which are considered to be current. Of these, only 5,000 have a published definition, and another five and a bit thousand are nearly there, fully described or described. Of the non-current names, which also include historical stratigraphic units, uh, there are also over 6,000 recognised misspellings. I'd really like to change those statistics so that we have more <laughs> defined units than misspelt ones. The database is accessible in various ways, whether you go in from the GA front page and click and choose data, highlighted here in red, and then the quick link to our information pages, or you bookmark the information page itself, which has links to useful advice and people, as well as to the database search, which is what's highlighted on this page. Or you go directly into the search. Um, this is what the search page looks like. And I've highlighted the information button in green, which can be helpful with syntax for searching, especially if you're uncertain of a spelling. There are another, a number of other options in the menu line, uh, outlined in red here, including the stratigraphic review tool, which allows authors and reviewers to see whether the stratigraphic names used in a proposed publication are currently and correctly spelt or not. You can also tell the strat units team about your new publications or any older references that we might have overlooked in indexing uh, through various feedback options. And the last option on the right hand side takes you back to the information pages. Oops. This is an example from the stratigraphic review tool highlighting current and correctly spelt names in green and non-current names in that orangey red colour. The tool usually offers alternatives for the orangey red names and if any of the units used in the paper are not highlighted at all, then that indicates they're new to the database for a range of reasons, including deliberate new units but also misspellings. And taking a step back to searching, while I don't expect you to read this, here is a typical example of search results for a name, in this case, Arionga Formation. And for those units with a definition, there is a link to the definition data, which I've circled on here, if we actually hold any. And each of the dark blue bars towards the bottom can be opened to provide more information including details of all of the references used to compile the data for this unit. The state downloads, uh, which is another of the options, also includes all of this information, including any available unit defini definition data. And for those of you within GA, you can also access the, uh, the external search tool through the GA intranet uh, and as well, you have access to view some additional data through our 
internal apex forms. So that's how to access the data we already hold. I'll now hand over to Christo to talk about what sort of information goes into a unit definition and why they're so useful. Hello everyone. I will be providing an overview of what is involved in defining stratigraphic units. In late June this year, Cathy and I, in our education roles as members of the Australian Stratigraphy Commission, led a workshop at the Australian Earth Sciences Convention in Perth on naming and defining stratigraphic units. This here was the overview slide. I don't propose to go into the level of detail provided then, but if there is interest in a rerun of the workshop, we can do that another day. The focus today is on why there is an ongoing need for education in stratigraphic procedures in general and why defining stratigraphic units is good basic science that enhances the quality of the data that becomes part of other projects and products. The reason it is important for us to provide education regarding stratigraphic procedures is that most university programs do not teach how to define stratigraphic units. Thus, it falls to members of the Stratigraphy Commission to educate all geologists working on Australian rocks in these matters. Now, as most geologists are aware, it is the observations that you make in field mapping and of drill core and through other studies of the rocks which are the basic data that are used for subsequent interpretations and data compilations. Organising these observations and findings into unit definitions and publishing them is good science that will be used and reused for many years to come. It is also one basis for deciding on the need for further work in an area. Now, it is important to note you don't have to wait until you know everything about a unit to write an initial definition. New information can always be added as it is determined and recognised. A minimal definition, it should be noted, will always be superior to no definition at all. Now, as stated earlier, of the 18,000 current unit names, less than a third of these are formally defined. This is really not ideal and, as Cathy stated, we need to improve these statistics. So, once you have identified the need for a new unit, you need to decide on the following. You need a distinctive name and a type section or locality must be set up. You can use the definition form as a guide to help you describe the unit as well as possible. The, it should be noted, a lot of the fields are not compulsory. And then the final stage, um, uh, sorry, the definition should be approved before publication and then the final stage thereafter is publication of the definition. As for the name itself, the name should consist of a geographic name plus either the dominant lithology, such as sandstone, granite, rhyolite, etc or a rank term, formation, group, member, etc. So given the 18,500 current stratigraphic names already in use and how often place names are reused around Australia, it is also good practice to check the Australian Stratigraphic Units database to see if your first choice is available and won't be confused with existing unit names. Ideally, you are looking for a unique name tied to a geographic feature. It may well be useful to discuss local place names with land managers and custodians to avoid proposing names that prove to be culturally sensitive or inappropriate. Once you have identified a name that is likely to be available, it is good practice to first reserve it so that others don't use the name for a different purpose. Sometimes longer geographic names are required to make the new unit more distinctive from existing unit names. For example, Mount Ainsley Volcanics is used in New South Wales and the ACT to distinguish from the Ainsley Volcanics in Western Australia. Once that is done, uh, we've moved to the type section. Now the type section is at the heart of the definition, 
since there must be a place where someone can go see what is typical of a unit. Locating and describing a type section or type area or locality is an essential part of the definition of a lithostratigraphic unit. Without it, others may not be sure what the unit includes and excludes. A properly set up type section is also very useful for geologists new to the stratigraphy of an area. There is therefore no point in having a type section that no one can, can look at. It must be generally accessible. Where possible, type sections are set up in areas of well-exposed outcrop, but if, as in the case of subsurface units, they are defined from drill core, the core must be held in a place where any geologist can arrange to come and inspect it. As for the essentials of a type section, the type section must be representative of the unit. It should include the typical lithologies and boundary relationships of the unit, if possible. Usually, the best exposure of the unit without structural complications is selected. It is worth noting, however, many units do not have 100% exposure anywhere, so the type sections have to take advantage of the best available exposure. As already mentioned, accessibility is important if the type section is to fulfill its role as a standard. For example, don't specify a type section in prohibited areas, such as a closed Aboriginal sacred site, or in physically inaccessible areas such as halfway up a sheer cliff. Now, nothing is certain, but there must also be a reasonable assurance of long-term preservation. For example, don't choose areas about to be submerged or covered over, mine or quarry faces that will be destroyed, or areas that are planned to be built over. All of that said, you do the best you can with what you have available. Some additional things to record when setting up a type section. Uh, you must record the latitude and longitude, if possible, of the base and the top of the unit. Provide a helpful description of how to find it or where the core is stored. A general description of the type section is necessary, including the thickness of the unit or an estimate, the, lith the lithologies, especially dominant or diagnostic ones, distinguishing or identifying features of the unit, in addition to the relationship with other units, any diagnostic fossils or any other significant features, including, but not limited to, structural features, geomorphology, geophysics, geochemistry, etc. So to aid geologists in writing unit definitions, uh, the GA stratigraphy information web pages provide the definition form that I mentioned earlier. Now, it may look a bit daunting, but as stated earlier, many of these fields are not compulsory. They are there to jog your memory about what to include, if known. Here is an example of the definition form showing all of the com commonly used criteria for defining a unit. Highlighted here with the stars are the essentials. The downloadable form also includes advice on what kind of information to put in each field. The completed definition form is then sent to the relevant state or territory stratigraphy commission member. Once the definition is improved, it is lodged with the ASUD team, where it can be loaded into the database and made available for all. Once the approved definition is received and added to the ASUD, it is considered to be published. You do not need to publish the de definition again in a separate article or paper, although you may wish to do so uh, as part of a journal article, explanatory notes, or report to help to illustrate some of the definition features better. And now here are a few examples of some definitions. This first example is of a minimal definition of the Christmas Creek member of the Pool Sandstone from Western Australia. As you can note, many of these fields are simply one sentence. This shows that on a base level, Defining a unit does not have to be a tremendous task. Obviously, more information is always better, but you can get away with bare bones initial definitions. And once again, 
These are always better than no definition at all. Now, I don't expect you to read all of this. This is just showing a more complete definition. And as you can see, more of the fields have been filled in with more information. And now just onto an example showing that you can redefine units in the future. Here we have the Deakin Volcanics. This unit initially had a very bare bones definition, quite similar to that of the Christmas Creek member, until being redefined in 1990, vastly improving the understanding of the unit. It is worth noting that in doing a redefinition of a unit, you need not redo every single field. All you have to do is explain and record the elements that are new or have changed. And if you say it is a re redefinition and use the definition form, rather than just discussing uh, the unit in a publication, then the elements of the redefinition will be more obvious to all. We had some more examples for workshop participants to discuss, but that is enough to give you a flavor of the workshop. And just a final note on definitions. If you are unsure about anything regarding reserving a name, setting up a type section, or defining a unit, the members of the Stratigraphy Commission are all here to help. I would recommend getting in touch with them at any stage of the process, should you have questions. Uh, and just to assist with this, here is a list of the State and Territory Stratigraphy Commission conveners. This is also available on the stratigraphy pages of the GA and the GSA websites. Okay, it is time to take a step back from the detail. Over the seminar, we've covered a basic introduction of stratigraphy and how this information is managed at GA in partnership with the Australian Stratigraphy Commission. And you've just heard some detail about the process for formally defining stratigraphic units. In this final section, I want to provide some examples of the value of having this stratigraphic information managed and delivered via the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database and some examples of what this enables. Now, as Cathy stated previously, it has been, um, it has been described as a secret weapon in part because it acts as a mega legend for Australian geological digital maps. We are not aware of any other country or continent of Australian size that maintains a continuously updated database of this kind. The ASAD also provides a link between sample points, including in boreholes, and polygon data. GA and other government, academic and industry geologists regularly collect observations and measurements from individual rock samples. These measurements include things like geochemistry, geochronology, isotopic signatures, and properties like density, magnetic susceptibility, porosity, strength, etc. Many of these observations are held in large databases here in Geoscience Australia or elsewhere. And of course, GA and state surveys, as well as the resource exploration industry, regularly make and use maps. Maps of different scales, and themes which are made up not of points but of geological polygons. The ASAD enables link linkage between point and polygon data at any scale. For example, if we want to tap into the wealth of detailed point information about geochemistry, age, density, etc. at the map scale, we can do this provided that point observations have been assigned to a stratigraphic unit. We can then assign that chemistry or age or density information to a mapped polygon, not just a single point. This linking role of the ASAD enables us and others to utilize point and polygon data together in generating new interpretive products. So here I will go into a few more illustrations of people and products that use the data held in the ASAD. Now, in an ideal world, samples used for geological members should be assigned to the appropriate current stratigraphic unit, and all mapped polygons should be assigned a stratigraphic unit. This is currently not true for all samples or polygons. Nevertheless, many links do exist. Groundwater studies use the ASAD. 
including work earlier this year to update the National Aquifer Framework managed by the Bureau of Meteorology. This had previously been based on a static download from the ASAD several decades ago, so quite out of date. Collaboration between GA groundwater staff and the Bureau of Meteorology staff led to an update earlier this year that now has live links to ASAD data, so it will be much easier to keep the units in the National Aquifer Framework up to date. Another example where the ASAD underpins a new national scale product is the database known as EGS, standing for Estimates of Geophysical and Geological Surfaces. This database was set up to address the challenge of resource exploration in the approximately 80% of Australia where the surface geology is dominated by a cover of relatively recent desert sands and or young sedimentary basins. A big challenge in these regions is to map the geology beneath the surface. A first order piece of information that exploration companies need is how deep do you have to drill to intersect particular rocks of interest? Now here we have an example from the EGS database. It uses a variety of data inputs, including geological interpretation of, of geophysical data from airborne electromagnetics, seismic and magnetic data, and geological data as well, described in well logs from many decades of drilling. Linking this data to the ASAD then allows access to further stratigraphic unit information through the Exploring for the Future portal. Now, once again, as you heard previously, the Alkaline Rocks Atlas is a recently released GA product, more focused on highlighting particular rock types that are prospective for some of the critical minerals Australia needs to find to support the energy transition away from fossil fuels. These rock types were largely identified through the ASAD and its source documents. Geological maps and stratigraphic information that they illustrate are fundamental inputs into more interpretive products too, like these mineral potential maps. To address the challenge of providing the mineral resources needed for the future, including to meet net zero targets, Geoscience Australia is developing a portfolio of predictive mineral potential maps. These maps are predictions rather than observations of the potential for various styles of mineral deposits from Australia. Here we're showing maps for magmatic related nickel copper platinum group elements on the left, sediment hosted copper in the middle, and sediment hosted lead zinc on the right. The red areas indicate regions considered to have high potential, and the blue areas are regarded as having low potential. As well as a range of other data inputs, production of these maps rely heavily on queries from the ASAD to map out the distribution of favorable and non-favorable rock types. So the geoscience data that is compiled into the Australian Stratigraphic Units database is helping to support the fundamental mapping data sets at GA, such as the Solid Geology and the Alkaline Rocks Atlas, which in turn help support mineral potential assessments for critical minerals. So, in conclusion, stratigraphic classification is an important base for a variety of further interpretations and models that help to reduce exploration risk and assist with land management decisions. Data in the ASAD has a traceable published source and GA is ensuring that it com complies with fair data principles. Findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, as well as being widely used. Unit definitions significantly improve the quality of the data available in the ASAD and members of the Australian Stratigraphy Commission have an important role in providing education on stratigraphic principles. I would ask you all to consider that the better the quality and the currency of the data available in the ASAD, the better the outcomes will be for all of our data users. Thank you all for listening and please feel free to ask either Kathy or myself any questions that you have.